And we're live. It's such an honor and pleasure and privilege to be chatting to uh, Professors Stephen Simpson and David Rowenheimer in Sydney in, in lockdown, unfortunately. They hope to be together. And we also hope to have Ted Naiman on, but he had a family emergency, he had to duck off for us. But um, yeah, thank you so much for your time today, guys. And it's a pleasure, Marty. <laughs> you, um, you guys are an incredible dynamic duo, just looking back through your career together. Of, of what you've achieved as a symbiotic relationship between the, the two of you and, and created so many papers and a couple of books. And um, I, I told Stephen I wasn't going to go into your your resume because it would take the whole hour. But, um, I mean, if you look at what you've achieved in terms of papers, 358 papers on PubMed for Professor Simpson, 196 on PubMed for... Um, David, and in 2012, you wrote The Nature of Nutrition, and then in, uh, in 2020, uh, you wrote Eat Like the Animals, sort of, I think, to try and get the information out there and try to share all your research over your whole career to try and communicate it in a digestible format for the general public and engage with people. And I wrote an article and um, you generously wrote to me and had started a dialogue and, and here we are having a chat. So yeah, it's, it's great that you're getting it out there. And um, yeah, H how did you guys meet? And I suppose in terms of um, collaborative career, it's been quite a, an amazing partnership together. Uh, it ha Yes, it has indeed, Marty. And uh, we, we, we first met in Oxford um, and we were both young biologists. David can tell the story of his arrival and how we ended up in White and Woods walking around that day. Dave, do you want to tell that story? Uh, yeah. Uh, so I arrived as a young PhD student from South Africa. I'd just done a master's um, uh, studying uh, the food choices of a species of butterfly that was really, caterpillars were really curious in that they only fed on foods containing cyanide. There are obvious yeah. sort of questions and interesting issues there. Anyway, I did my master's and um, uh, the theory around at the time was that cyanide was the stimulation for them to feed. All of the patterns suggested that to be the case. And I kind of found that sort of true in my research, but of course you can't understand feeding without considering the complexity of diets and mm -hmm. foods, caterpillars or otherwise, not just cyanide, complex mixtures of things. Um, so I got really interested in the nutritional backdrop. I went over to Oxford to do a PhD, um, originally thinking of doing it with the same group of animals, similar questions. I met Steve, we were, um, we were both demonstrating in a, a practical class, a, a field uh, class for undergraduate students. And we found ourselves stationed at the same position in White and Woods, the ancient forests in the, near Oxford, started speaking and immediately saw this is somebody who thinks the same way that I do mm. about complexity and nutrition. So that's mm. the way that it started from my perspective. And we, you know, we discussed it further and eventually I decided to do a PhD under Steve's supervision. And one of the things we did is take it further to invent the framework nutritional geometry for mm. formally understanding the complexity in nutrition. So how many decades ago was that that you met in Oxford? So that was 1987. Um, wow. And wow. I'd, I'd been studying up to that point um, for my PhD, which uh, I'm a Queenslander, Marty. So I came yeah, in, in Brisbane. Brisbane went to London, did my PhD, studying the, the, the behavior of appetite and the physiology of appetite in locusts. And um, then I segued into uh, neurobiology of feeding in primates, in monkeys, um, in the Department of Experimental Psychology in Oxford, and then moved back, having considered that the brain of a primate was far too complex to try and understand <laughs> fundamental things about uh, the neurobiology of feeding. So I moved back into the zoology department in Oxford and started working on locust feeding physiology and started to unpack nutrient specific appetites. And that was around the time when um, David arrived in Oxford and uh, everything that followed, followed. And really it was mm. a, a, a typical case in science where serendipitous 
coming together of ideas and interests and uh, the flash of understanding between two people about mm -hmm. the way you think about the world can, can have really unexpected outcomes. And the real so, complementarity as well in that I came into it with uh, my interest focused more on the ecological evolutionary side and Steve mm -hmm. came more from the mechanistic experimental side. And of course, both are intricately involved mm. with the other and bringing together these different um, strengths or experience and expertise was a strong complementarity. So is one of you more the, the mathematician and analyst? Is that David and, and, and Stephen's more in the uh, neurobiology aspect where you both sort of inhabit the same field? We sort of overlap extensively around um, the control of behaviour, I think, and, and our mathematical um, understanding is equivalent. Um, right. we, 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 as in any um, endeavour where you bring people together across disciplines, you, mm. you reach your own limits before too far and mm. you have to then recruit, you know, outstanding people to support you. So. <coughs> when it comes to the complexities of managing um, multiple nutrient dimensions. We're, we're pretty good mathematicians, but we've employed some of the world's best when it comes to mixture analysis. And wow. um, again, that was a, a serendipitous meeting, wasn't it, Dave? We met through an EU aquaculture project wow. where we were brought to, to help support uh, the optimality or the optimal design of, of uh, of foods um, provided to farmed fish. And we, we were wow. part of a collaboration that involved people in Norway and Finland and Spain and, and France and the UK. Um, and we met um, a, an extraordinary um, nutritional mixture analyst called Kari Ruonen, who's a, a Finnish scientist. And we spent a lot of time with Kari um, working through the methodologies that have provided the foundations for much of the analysis that we do mm. now. Um, and we're, we're working with some really remarkable um, pure mathematicians at the University of Sydney. Alistair Senior in our team mm. is another really extraordinary um, nutritional wow. analyst because uh, one of the foundational things that you need to understand nutrition is how you manage mixtures and mm. um, traditionally people have just got it wrong and they still do mm. um, it's very easy to to be profoundly misled if you misanalyze complex mixture designs and that after all is what nutrition is it's about mixtures. yeah, yeah and the, the human appetite and, and modeling that to understand why we eat and why we stop eating and our appetite and right. The, the multi multitude of factors that come into that is completely fascinating. So how did the protein leverage hypothesis come about? Did it suddenly appear in the data after you've studied locusts and slime and, and primates and all sorts of things? And, and, and David's fascinatingly talked about the benefit of understanding outside your own species to understand more about your own biology um, and the power of that because we, we're inside this goldfish bowl and we don't know there's water, but when you look outside of the apes and locusts, you it becomes apparent when you reflect back on your own biology. David, do you want to take that step or do you want me to? Oh, no, no, <laughs> I can have a start and, and then I'll hand quickly over to David. It's hard doing these three-handers, isn't it, Marty? Because <laughs> uh, but the yeah, look, um, one of the one of the problems I think with uh, the field of human nutrition is that we focus too heavily on ourselves, um, mm. and and it's very easy to trivialize the study of mice or flies or locusts or anything else as being you know that's that's nothing to do with us. Actually, it's everything to do with us. Um, and coming at the natural world as evolutionary biologists um, and comparative physiologists, which is what we are, mm. has enabled us to really seek inspiration and look for commonalities that, that extend across different species. Mm. Um, now, there are sort of trite commonalities that, 
you would be drawing a very long bow to make a conclusion about an experiment from, uh, let's say, a mouse to a human. But there are also fundamental commonalities that mm. really can um, um, really illuminate profoundly important things that other people mm. haven't necessarily seen. And protein leverage was an example, I think, of that, or at least um, the understanding that all species, so far as we know, possess separate nutrient appetites. We mm. don't just feel full or hungry. Animals care about the regulation of multiple different nutritional mm. components. So I think at that point, I'll, I'll hand to David. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that, yeah, that sort of covers it, except to say that um, one of the things we were really interested in is the evolutionary derived prediction that animals would not regulate on a specific nutrient, that all nutrients are important by definition, um, and particular mixes provide better outcomes than others. So we would predict that animals had separate mechanisms to regulate nutrients intake separately and arrive at a, the best balance that supported optimal evolutionary fitness. So we started doing experiments on the locust system in this, and that's where we found that um, we were able to explain and predict diet selection on the concept of separate nutrient-specific appetites. That led to the question of, well, if animals use these nutrient-specific appetites, which we showed locusts had, um, to balance the diet, what happens in environments where they're constrained and unable to balance the diet? In that case, rather than cooperating or collaborating, those appetites come into conflict. Um, and we tested this on the locust. And what we found was that when the appetites for protein and carbohydrate come into conflict, then the protein appetite predominates, which mm -hmm. means that um, protein is regulated most strongly to what we call the target level and carbohydrate intake fluctuates passively with the ratio of protein to carbohydrate in the diet. Um, yeah. So that was the origins from that perspective of the protein leverage hypothesis. Um, we then extended from locusts to many other species and found very similar things in terms of nutrient-specific appetites. Many of those species also, we found that protein appetite dominated. And of mm. course, that got us thinking about humans. Yeah, so you published um, the protein leverage hypothesis back in 2005 and you've said from there it's you know that's 12 years ago now and really it's gone beyond a hypothesis to uh, approved reality in so many different species and so many different populations um might, might be just be worth just quickly unpacking this it's unfortunately the the two-dimensional version which is where you started but basically what this means is that if you to me is if you start out with more carbohydrate and fat energy, it'll be really hard to get back to meet your protein requirement and you're much more likely to overeat um, carbohydrate and fat energy to get the protein requirement. Potentially, if you start out a little bit lower, you're going to more likely meet that protein requirement and then later you'll naturally chase that final top up, I suppose, of, of energy from fat and carbs without necessarily over overshooting the total energy requirement. Is that a good summary? You can probably correct me um, on that. Well, no, Ma Ma Marty, what you've got there is, um, is, is multiple things. It's an important graph, actually. Mm. So, uh, yeah, and you've confined it to protein and non-protein energy, essentially, which is a, a really simple and powerful way to, to mm. explain. So what, you, what you've shown there is what we call the intake target is the uh, the optimal mixture integrated over a given period in, in, in an organism's life, um, such that if you attain that level of protein and that level of non-protein energy simultaneously, you've hit the target. Hmm. Um, now, hitting the target, you can either achieve by selecting a balanced diet and a diet here in your graph is represented as a line a radial um, mm. and the green line is by definition a balanced diet so if you chose that diet from the cafeteria of available diets and you ate nothing but eat you would 
move up that green line until you hit the target and, mm. and hence simultaneously get the right amount of both protein and non-protein energy. Um, if you don't have a green balanced diet, then what you could do is select between two complementary imbalanced diets. And you've shown those red lines. Mm. Neither of those is balanced because if you ate nothing, if you ate nothing but the, um, the steeper line, you'll just head ever on upwards along that red line without intersecting the target. Um, but if you were to swap between it and the other unbalanced diet, the lower red line, you could zigzag um, and your blue lines don't quite capture the zigzag shape mm. because you have to move parallel to each of the red lines when you make an excursion from one to the other. But essentially, you've got the idea there. Mm. Um, so your appetite for protein and carbohydrate and non-protein energy could guide you through selecting between complementary foods to get to the target. Mm. And there's no one However, perfect food that's got the right mixture. You sort of the, the appetite sort of exactly. it's a it's a target seeking missile that eventually lands you at where you need to be. Absolutely. And actually, Marty, it's interesting you show this figure because this is exactly the experimental design that we used initially in, mm. in locusts and then many other species to show that they do select a specific point. And if you change the foods that you give them, they eat different amounts of the different combinations mm. to get to that same point of intake, that same intake target, showing that what's really important to them is that mixture of nutrients. You can then superimpose on top of that a response surface that shows the uh, relationship between different nutritional intakes and things of importance like body composition, growth mm. rate, reproduction, lifespan. Um, and in many cases, what you find is that the peak, the optimum, sits right on top of that intake target. Mm. That yeah, I, 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 go, on, go on, Stephen. No, no, no. I was just going to say then then you can take it to the next scenario, which is the one you were introducing with protein leverage. And that is mm. what happens if you only had one of those two imbalanced pink lines and that was it. Mm. So it by by consuming that diet, you're 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 stuck on what we call a food rail or a, a diet rail. You have to mm. keep going um, ever outwards from the origin along that trajectory and you'll never get to your intake target so you're going to have to compromise between eating too much um, or too little of one versus the other nutrient in the mode. Mm. so if you were stuck on that um, steeper line which is lower in protein to non-protein energy than than the target level what could you do? Well, you could eat until you reach the non-protein target um, level, which um, you'd need to put your cursor a bit. That, that's that's about there. Yeah. And if you stop there, you've got the right amount from the perspective of non-protein energy, but you've eaten too little protein. Mm. Or you could go a bit further up until you got to the same number of calories, which would mm. be about there. Or you could keep going and going and going until you got to the right amount of protein. And if you did that, you would have over-consumed um, non-protein and hence total energy substantially. Hmm. Um, and, and, and a modern food system is basically a, a, a mixture of fat and carbs with low protein for various reasons. So a lot of yeah. us are stuck on that line. Right, exactly. So the, low, the, the lower, and it's only marginally lower, but nonetheless um, because of the fact that the protein target for humans is relatively small as a proportion of total energy mm. it gives it enormous power to drive over consumption of energy on a low protein diet and that's mm. that's the protein leverage effect and and um, by contrast if you're on a higher protein diet mm. the lower line there um, if your body cares more about uh, reaching the target level of protein and not over consuming protein, which seems to be true of us, mm. um, then you would stop having eaten fewer calories and hence would um, potentially lose weight as a result of mm. that. Um, and that can be a bad thing if you're a locust um, <laughs> and, or, or a person, actually, or yeah. it can be a good thing depending yeah. on what you want Context. to achieve. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I, I suppose that with like if you're living on egg white and, and kangaroo, which is super high protein percentage, you get to a point where you can only eat so much of that stuff before you get really full and you have no more cravings for that food, but you still have a, a hunger for energy. Um, so you end up still being hungry just because it's so hard for the body to convert protein to ATP to metabolize this energy. Um, so we've got a, a, one fascinating part of the, the paper, the initial 2005 paper was um, you made the observation that although fat and carbs are both increasing in the diet, you'd expect protein to find a limit, but the reality is protein continues to to go up. And you made the, the point that I think is lost on a lot of low carbers and, and keto people that I see is they, they say, well, I've got diabetes, so I need to avoid protein because it'll turn to glucose. But I basically made the reverse point, just you need to compensate by increasing the protein percentage um, to mitigate that glucose loss, uh, that protein loss to, to glucose through gluconeogenesis. Can you just unpack that? Because I think that's an incredibly important point. It, 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 it is. We, we agree, Marty, actually. So, so let, I'll frame it in a slightly different way. The, uh, the expectation from a, a very traditional energy in, energy out model of obesity would be that if you let's say we're fooled into eating too many calories because the food environment just tasted fantastic and there were lots of mm. carbs and fats. You, you, would, you would increase your calorie intake, you would get heavier, but as you get bigger, you require more calories. So at mm. some point, um, weight rise globally should have plateaued. Mm. Um, but it hasn't. It's it's accelerated over time. Mm. So there's a missing um, vicious cycle or positive feedback in the system somewhere. And we we early on appreciated that what that likely is, is that as you become insulin resistant, um, your body starts to waste protein. It wastes mm. protein in in a couple of ways, principally because insulin normally inhibits um, proteolysis in muscles mm. so you start to break down your own lean tissue um, and also it disinhibits gluconeogenesis so you start burning unnecessarily mm. protein to produce um, energy in, in your liver so what that's doing is essentially pushing the target higher mm. and as the target goes up you're going in a low protein world to have to eat even more to get to that now higher target, which will make things worse. And so it's going round and round and driving accelerated obesity um, uh, globally. And, and mm. so, so that notion that your protein target depends, amongst other things, it depends profoundly on your life stage but it, mm. it also depends incredibly on your metabolic health um, and a paper that we're in the process of finalizing at the moment shows that um, not only as you get into very late life you start to become less efficient in mm. your use of protein for the same reasons and we talk mm. about this in the book uh, the same thing happens during uh, the menopause transition in women and that may turn out to be an important contributor to some of the increased risk of overweight and uh, metabolic um, wow. disease during that that period, particularly in our modern Western industrialized food environment. Yeah. And there are quite a few other things that that framework or hypothesis can help explain that remain unexplained otherwise. One is the other end of the um, of the life cycle, and that mm. is the association between um, formula-fed infants and um, susceptibility to obesity later in life. Now, if you do, if you look at the compositions of infant formula, human infant formula, a lot of them are higher in protein than human breast milk, which is remarkably low. It's seven percent, roughly, of mm -hmm. energy. And formula is, you know, several percentage points higher than that. Many of them. And what we've hypothesised is that what feeding human infants these high protein formulas does is causes their body to compensate by reducing the efficiency 
at yep. which protein is retained and utilized. And if that reduced efficiency is carried through um, into uh, later life, that's going to cause that exacerbation of protein leverage that Steve mentioned to, mm. to mention because it increases the coordinate of the protein target. Yeah. So people who've been fed those diets will have to eat more protein um, to reach the target so the appetite systems are recalibrated and in mm. so doing they'll have to overeat fat and carbohydrates to a greater extent to meet that increased um, protein target. Mm. We've actually demonstrated recently in experiments in mice that this can happen in utero. So placing mothers, pregnant mothers, on a higher than optimal protein diet yep. leads to um, pups born with a higher protein target, and that puts them at greater risk of obesity in a lower protein environment. So, mm. so these things are tractable experimentally in model systems, but uh, yes, the implications are pretty huge, actually. Yeah. Uh, one other thing I, I see a lot of misinterpretation about is more protein versus a higher protein percentage. Um, people just think if I eat more protein, I'll lose weight, but protein often comes just with added fat and they just end up consuming more calories. But our analysis, which is just perfectly mirrors yours, is that you know it's a higher protein percentage, which is a lower energy from fat and carbs. It's it, overall, it's a slight increase in absolute protein quantity, but uh, it, it's the reduction in fat and carb energy, which is easy, easily accessible energy that tends to lead people who need to lose weight to, to be able to, to lose weight in that context. So, do you want to just unpack that and anything else that? Uh, people tend to misinterpret in your work. There's probably a lot over, over the whole decades. <laughs> well, the, the percent versus absolute issue is a fundamental one. Dave, do you want to go for that one? No, you go for it, Steve. You're... The, the, but Marty, you're, ex, you're exactly right. Um, the, the misunderstanding of proportions and amounts is profound. Um, and, and it's seen in as something as simple as saying what's a high protein diet mm. um, and we actually explore that in in the 2019 um, paper mm. where we sort of updated protein leverage and put it in a broader context and dealt with some of the misconceptions um, and and yes the difference between you can be on a high protein diet proportionately but eat no more in absolute terms mm. Of protein and vice versa. So mm. um, you need really to get that the, the the relationship between proportions and amounts very clear. Otherwise, terrible things can happen. Mm. Let let alone the notion that um, high protein or more protein is good. Therefore, even more must be better. Mm. So, so mm. that sort of tendency we all have to think in terms of linear regressions yeah. rather than mixtures and balance and optima and multi-dimensional yep. optima. Uh, that's what nutritional geometry is all about. Yeah, it's so incredibly really complex and interesting. Mm. That, that relationship between proportions and amounts is absolutely central to understanding the protein leverage hypothesis and nutritional geometry in general. Mm. Because, of course, what the protein leverage hypothesis states is that um, if you change the proportion of macronutrients in the diet, the absolute amounts that are eaten are going to be influenced in a way that can either be positive, negative, mm. or neutral. And so by miss, missing, you're exactly right, by missing that um, distinction between proportions and amounts, you miss the logic of nutritional geometry and also the protein leverage hypothesis and all that follows from that. Mm. Yeah, it's you can't get more you know, protein from butter or bacon and not overdo the fat <laughs> intake, basically. No, 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 no. You can get exactly the right amount of protein from um, eating nothing but donuts, but you'll end up with a lot of it else extra that you didn't know. Yeah, there's yeah. Martin, the, the real surprise that came, and one of the things that, that mathematicians and those who model systems like ourselves get a real kick out of is the, the counterintuitive, the surprise. And the surprise was coming from the graph you just showed, protein intakes have remained incredibly stable 
for decades, yet fat and carb energy has gone up. And that's led people to, yeah, there's the green line versus mm. the other. The, people have therefore argued over, is it fat, is it carbs? And if you substitute one with the other, you don't solve the problem, which, mm. um, of course, is what happens around the fat, saturated fat, sugar mm. discussions. Um, entirely pointless because what's happened is that the profound um, driver has been, is inherent in that green line. The protein mm. hasn't changed. It therefore hasn't contributed the calories that have driven mm. the expanding waistlines of the world, but it's ex it's exerted the leverage over total calorie intake um, through its being regulated more strongly than those other calories, and that's been the problem. So there was a surprise there that surprised the field when we first introduced mm. the idea. Of course, a bit yeah. of a bit of consternation it still does actually you only need like a a one percent change in protein percentage to bring about a like a 14 13 percent change in overall energy intake which is massive yeah i'd love you to tell that story about why this wasn't accepted initially you, you published it and they sat on it and they just basically thought it was ludicrous and they couldn't believe that they'd missed it and how these bug biologists <laughs> discovered the the major lever to uh, human obesity that is bankrupting the world, basically. Yeah, it was uh, it, it was prior to um, publication, actually. So we we had published uh, what we call the Swiss Chalet study um, in two thousand and three, um, and we were in Berlin together for a year at the Wissenschaftskolleg, the Institute for Advanced Study, which was an extraordinary year. And we were, we were writing a different book, actually, which we never finished. But um, <laughs> during that year, we, we published the initial paper and then um, put together what was the protein leverage hypothesis paper. Um, and we submitted it as one does for peer review. And, and we heard nothing for... Uh, more than six months, which is getting a bit long, um, it can take months, but this was this seemed overly long. And eventually it was accepted without any particular criticism it, from the referees. It was it just took a long time. Um, and I we recount in the book how I, I gave a talk in Cambridge in 2005. Um, and a very eminent nutritional, human nutritional scientist came up to me at the reception afterwards and admitted he had sat on it for six months. Um, and he, he thought we were right, but he, he, he just said, you have to understand this is very hard. Um, it's hard for us to have a couple of entomologists come in and point something out, which is actually quite obvious. And it's di diabolical too to the whole way we view nutrition. It's not about trying to deprive yourself all the time of nutrients and eating less and fighting hunger. It's about giving your body what it needs first enough protein, but then enough carbs, enough fat, enough other nutrients. You talked about sodium and calcium, which I'd love to dig into a little bit more later. Um, to and, and also the, the, to add to that, Marty, and also trusting your appetites to tell you what it is that you need. Mm. Because that's one of the things that we've found in all of the species that we've studied is they have no diet books, they have no calculators, computers, but they get mm. it right. The way they get it right is using the same mechanisms as we have, nutrient-specific mm. appetites. Mm. Which yeah, you just need to give the, the human body the right food. Exactly. Yeah. The right food environment. Mm. If you surround your appetites with an environment that they've that more closely resembles what they've evolved to operate so well in, um, all else will follow. The problem mm. is we change that environment so radically that it trips them up. And we'll speak more about that later, I assume. Yeah. And it, com it comes back, Marty, to your very first point about why take a comparative evolutionary view of the world. And mm. the answer to that is, Nutrition is a really hard problem. You, you're mm. trying to optimize 60 or 100 dimensions simultaneously in a, in a world where foods are various and dangerous and, and um, mm. unreliable in time and space. And, and that 
solution has been achieved um, innumerable times in different food environments by natural selection. Um, mm. And if you understand how that's happened, how the complexity of nutrition has been um, rendered tractable and translated into real biology in real environments, then, then you get an understanding which can profoundly change the way you look at ourselves. And that's that mm. I think, the key message. Yeah, the, you can trust your instincts to in the right environment to seek out the foods you need. Um, so, so to move on to something a little bit more complex, um, this is a nice 2D rendering from your initial paper, which is um, basically says if you want to lose weight, dial up the protein percentage. If you want to gain weight, dial down the protein percentage. And it's nominally 14 15% on average, I think you had from that initial paper. But depending on who you are and your life stage and how active you are and how much muscle mass you're carrying, et cetera, that will change. But then um, this is Ted Naiman's rendering of, of your geometric framework. Do you want to just unpack that? Uh, we've talked about how complex this is and why did you create a geometric framework of nutrition to, to take it beyond two dimensions? So, so that's exact, that exactly gets at the point that you raised earlier, uh, Marty, and that is the relationship between amounts and proportions. So what mm -hmm. we're looking at in those figures are the three-dimensional proportions of diets. So each point represents a percentage energy contributed by protein, fat, and carbohydrate. Um, and as that point moves within that space, you can see geometrically at a glance what is changing in those proportions. So mm -hmm. if it stays on the, at the same um, position on the protein target and it moves up or down, fat to carbohydrate ratio is changing while protein remains constant. Mm -hmm. If it stays on the same line, if protein's on the X and carbohydrates on the Y, the same radial then protein to carbohydrate ratio is remaining constant and the extent to which that is diluted or concentrated in relation to fat is changing. So you've got that three-dimensional proportional representation mm. underlying the data. What the surface shows us there is not a proportion but an amount. Mm. In that case, it's energy intake associated with diets of different compositions. So that's exactly that translation between dietary proportions and energy and, and the amount of energy that you eat in response and spontaneously in response to different proportions. The left hand um, just will we'll come to that because David has just explained the right hand diagram, which is mm. in proportions. The other way you can represent um, and try and integrate nutritional outcomes is um, to map them where each axis is an amount eaten over a given mm. time period of the nutrient um, in the model. And in these models, we're including just the three macronutrients, and you can obviously unpack them or you can add in other nutrients mm. as you wish. But the, the idea was if you can um, r represent a point in a space where a person or a mouse or a locust or whatever has eaten a certain amount of the three different nutrients in the model, you can associate with that point all manner of things mm. about the animal's response. Um, it could be the pattern of gene expression um, in the liver, or it could be levels of circulating IGF-1, or it could be uh, how long the animal lived or how many babies it had or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, you could measure anything you want about the organism at any level in its biology from molecules through to life history outcomes and you can map them onto nutrition and you can relate different responses to nutrition and the shapes of those response landscapes, which we present there as heat maps, hmm. um, you can relate them one to the other. So you can start looking for accordance or discordance between hmm. different outcomes. So how long the animal lived, how many um, offspring it left, um, the expression of the liver proteome, um, its risk of diabetes, whatever you want, you can map as a response landscape. 
And that gives you a really powerful way of integrating nutrition mm. and the influence of nutrition uh, across levels in biology. And that's what we call nutritional geometry. And you've done multiple mouse studies now with 800 or so mice in each study, which is you know, massive undertaking for each one to get those profile surfaces. And I suppose there's got to be some limitations between interpreting mice to humans, but it gives you some clue and uh, a bit of a pro uh, hypothesis generation for future investigation and understanding humans. No, no, completely. And so the, those um, where, where uh, I guess, crazy in the general um, scheme of things to, to attempt some of these studies. Initially, of course, we did them in insects. Um, and you can take fruit flies and you can have a, a tabletop with um, 28 different diets and a thousand flies and you can follow them across their life course. And it's a miserably um, tedious and difficult thing to do, but you can do it. Um, when it comes to doing the same sort of an experiment with, with mice or let alone anything else, it becomes um, really, really challenging. And you're talking about, say, in, that, in our first big mouse study, which um, is, is a landmark in, in the field, we commenced mm. that in 2008 or 2009. Um, it took five years to, to get to the point where we had the initial analysis and of course it's given rise to all manner of other huge studies <coughs> since. Um, mm. and uh, I, I remember we our most recent study which was an in, looking at the interaction between some of the key drugs that are used to treat diabetes oh, wow. or extend life and nutrition where we have 40 diet treatments um, we had six tons of mouse food wow. delivered and stored um, 40 different treatments Easy. Wow. Huge what, what, yeah. Where do you house all the mice? Is that in, all in the Charles Perkins Centre basement, or? Yeah. In the, wow. We've got, we've got very um, well it, superb facilities. Actually, we we also have germ-free mouse facilities for doing the experiments we do on the microbiome and relating that to nutrition. Um, so it's a it, it it's a factory. It involves. Dozens of different collaborators, all expert in their different mm. tissues, um, and it all comes together through these these geometric models, which are mm. the ultimate indicator and integrator of, of all these things that you measure. So. Mm. Um, you guys talk about high protein percentage being a, a therapeutic intervention, and I suppose in the context of a an obese general population, I suppose, how do we interpret that? And going back to the the misinterpretation of more protein versus high protein percentage, and there's definitely, you, you generally focus on, I've heard you talk about, you know, we're looking at a population level intervention and how do we eat as a population and giving population level advice, but based on potentially obesity, BMI, waist to height ratio, how do most people generally need to move? Obviously, on, on this curve, there's some people with who are underweight who definitely need to increase their protein percentage, but a lot of people are overweight and therefore probably need to, sorry, increase their protein percentage rather than decrease. Uh, how do we, is, is that how you interpret that? I suppose it gets more complex when you look into the longevity and too much protein and can you stay on a, a high protein percentage diet over the long term beyond the point of getting back to a, an optimal BMI. Uh, Dave, do you, do you want to go for that one? No, you can go ahead, Steve. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, we, we have been very careful in trying to um, manage the discussion around therapeutic versus habitual. I think that's mm. a, it's important. And we, we, you've probably heard us use the, uh, the example of a defibrillator as being a Mm. A useful intervention when you're having cardiac arrest, but you wouldn't use it as a, a normal part of your daily healthy heart regime. So um, it, it, there's no doubt that there's uh, you can use diet therapeutically to achieve an outcome which um, has benefits, and that could include um, you know weight loss, um, improving metabolic health, insulin um, sensitivity, and so forth. 
um, there will be costs and you have to balance those mm. um, the benefits and the costs. And it's just, I think one of the things we've been very careful to try and point out is that we need to admit that there are both benefits and costs to mm. um, any dietary um, combination. And that's, mm. that's represented in the mapping of nutritional mm. geometry. And you're, you're quite right. We've come to the point where therapy, which is normally considered as a response to a rare instance of somebody needing fixing, has become a sort of population average. Um, mm. When 63% of Australians are, are classified, or even more now, 67, mm. classified as um, overweight or obese, then it becomes something that we need to be mindful about across mm. society. Um, but that's led us very much into how at a population level do you improve um, the macronutrient balance of the diet um, in a way that is simplest achieved in our modern food system? Um, mm. And the answer to that is get rid of ultra-processed foods. <laughs> it's the obvious first step, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one of the um, getting back to an earlier conversation we had, one of the risks of chronic exposure to high protein diets is that the protein target is shifted upwards for the same right. reason that chronic exposure in infant formula shifts the protein target of de early development in humans. That can happen later in life. And if that happens, then you're more susceptible to overeating fat and carbohydrate through protein leverage as soon as you go back to a diet that contains a lower percentage of protein. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and maybe to, to move on, I know we're conscious of time, to my favourite topic uh, of, of potential nutrient leverage in the 1990, uh, sorry, 2019 paper you mentioned um, different appetites for protein, carbohydrate, fat, as well as some micronutrients such as sodium and calcium. And we've, with our chronometer data from 40,000 people, we've now got 100,000 days of data. Um, definitely see, you know, the more sodium per calorie, the less you eat. There's definitely a satiety response to that uh, as well as calcium. But similarly with, you know, all 34 micronutrients and macronutrients, we see a similar response. It's not just for, for protein, it's for all different manner of, of micros. There's sort of a, a satiety response. You get to a point where you get enough folate, you get enough sodium, you get enough vitamin B6 and your body goes in search for other nutrients that are more important because it's satisfied that craving and, and overall the the higher nutrient density you get in your diet the greater satiety and and largely protein is is proportional to nutrient density so i just wonder how much is um a correlation between protein and nutrient density and i think on on twitter the other day we were um ted Naiman and, and kevin hall and i think it was you david were uh going backwards and forwards about uh, the original chart we showed here and Kevin Hall was querying. There's a massive difference between low protein and, and high protein percentage, uh, perhaps a, a 2,000 calorie per day difference. But when we look at um, this, uh, this orange line, it's the my, uh, sorry, nutrient optimizer data where people are uh, at a high protein percentage prioritizing nutrients more and this is half a million days of my fitness pal data where maybe there's not such a priority on um the other nutrients it's just protein so you know the hypothesis here is that there's a nutrient leverage hypothesis in action that it's not just macros it's about getting enough micros minerals vitamins essential fatty acids as well as amino acids so i just um love to pick your brains on that and is is that a possibility and and how do we get a 34 dimensional um uh, graph to model all the different micronutrient interactions so the first thing we would need to show if there's a nutrient leverage effect is that there's specific appetites for those nutrients now of the ones that you presented um, in addition to the macronutrients, there are well-established nutrient-specific appetites for sodium and for calcium. Mm. 
Mm. And neither of those would I predict exert strong leverage over the intake of macronutrients specifically in humans. Sodium, the reason is that it's added separately to food. So it can be manipulated independently mm. as can water. And you wouldn't expect them to be leveraged in the same way if you can add protein um, mm. separately to your diet, then it wouldn't leverage fat and carbohydrate necessarily. Um, calcium, I wouldn't expect it to be strong leverage for the reason that we have mass massive body stores of those throughout our bones. It's a macro micronutrient. Um, so so it, it certainly plays a very important role in the diet, but it's a question of time span. Mm. Um, in the short term, I wouldn't expect us to regulate calcium in the same way as we do protein for that reason. We don't have mm. massive body stores of protein to draw in the same way. And also, actually, Marty, we, we, we addressed exactly that point in um, 1993, I think it was, where in mm. locusts, um, so we're back to, back to locusts, um, locusts have a specific appetite for sodium. And if you give them um, foods that are complementary in their um, salt versus macronutrient composition, then they'll, they'll select a target for salt mm. and for macronutrients, and they'll do that beautifully. However, if you, if you force them to have to um, pit sodium regulation against macronutrient regulation, they totally abandon sodium regulation. So it has no leverage at all over the macronutrients. And that's actually been a real problem for humans because even though we have a sodium appetite, when our sodium comes mixed in processed foods, our macronutrient appetites will control how much we eat. Mm. And that all, as just by, by virtue of correlation, we'll end up eating too much sodium and that has... Mm. You know, mm. terrible effects on hypertension and, and you know, mm. cardiovascular health, etc. well known. Um, so I, I would suspect a lot of those relationships you've shown yep. are most likely to reflect correlation rather than specific appetite regulation. That would be our prediction anyway. Yeah. So, and okay. quite possibly a very simple correlation between the proportion of processed foods in the diet and nutrient intake. Because yeah, that's which... going to correlate with protein, it's going to correlate with mm. fat and carbohydrate, it's going to correlate with micronutrients very critically. Mm. Yeah, which also comes into energy density and uh, fibre, which you've talked about as well. And, and they're all sort of correlated in a complex food matrix that, uh, yeah. It, it also, I think, is another really important point is that appetites compete um, where, they, where, where there are separate appetites. Um, but there, there are many cases um, at least contributing to the ultimate intake decisions in ways that uh, are not totally passive. So protein leverage in its extreme form would mm. suggest that protein appetite dominates fat and carb and everything else appetite. Mm. Um, and it's typically not that strong. In humans, it's, it's, it's pretty strong, but it's not complete. Uh, in mice, it's much weaker. Um, it's it because they have a really strong carbohydrate appetite. So if you go on a, a high protein diet, the carbohydrate appetite in the mouse will drive increased consumption of uh, of food to get enough carb carbohydrate mm. as well. And even though on balance protein wins, it doesn't win by that much. In mm. humans, it wins by a lot more. And in some of the primate systems that David's look at, uh, David's looked at in the field protein doesn't win at all. Um, it depends very much on the ecology of the, the species, the system, and so on. Hmm. And the current deficiencies potentially you talk sure. about PICO with, you know, people actually eat dirt and, you know, women have yeah. crazy cravings in that, you know, that time of the month or when they're pregnant for particular nutrients that are potentially deficient. But once you get enough of those particular nutrients, you go and search for those. But, yeah, it'd be interesting to explore more. It, it's quite interesting. One pattern that we found in the broader primate comparative research is that the species – 
that tend to protein, prioritize protein are the ones that have evolved and operate in a relatively low protein environment. Mm. So that in itself says something about the evolutionary nutritional environment of humans. We show mm. this pattern that we find in other primates when they've evolved in a low protein environment. If you look at mm. mountain gorillas, they've evolved in a relatively high protein environment for long period. Mm. They spend uh, eight months of the year in a 30% protein environment. They don't prioritize protein. They prioritize non-protein energy. Mm. They do the exact opposite. And that pattern is the pattern that we found only um, elsewhere, only in carnivores that again have evolved obviously in a high protein environment. Mm. This is one way you can use evolutionary yeah. comparative analysis to triangulate as another source of evidence mm. on, on what it is our biology is about. And you see a similar effect, I think, with sodium as, you know, that we're, we're said to have evolved in a low sodium environment where we seek out sodium. So therefore, adding sodium to junk food is just an amazing way of making us over consume that as well as adding fat and carbs. So it's the perfect combination. Yeah. Um, so Conscious of time, you guys have uh, got another meeting, I believe, at, at 12. But um, how? what's the future hold for, for the two of you and the protein leverage hypothesis and your research and converting this into real-world policy? I've heard David talk about some fascinating work you're doing in that space that's really exciting for the future. I think for me, the really important point is to begin to unpack the um, idiosyncrasies of human food environments, to continue mm. to unpack that, but in the broader ecological sense. We know what's driving the problem. We know the categories of foods that are doing it, but to unpack the drivers that make um, the continued um, access to these foods as prevalent as what they are, that's the critical thing. Because it's only mm. in that way, by taking an ecological approach to the system, that you can identify the key leverage or points, points where we can start thinking about changing it. We can't do it mm. at the level of human behavior alone. And you know, the mm. many people think you can simply decide what to eat and, and, and that will solve it. But it doesn't work that way because they're much broader complexities, just like an ecosystem. Mm. And then the other side, of course, is to continue to unpack the mechanisms, and maybe Steve will speak more about that. Mm. Yeah, look, look I think um, David's right. There's the very big picture. How do we reshape human food systems, and how do, how do we do that in a way that's going to actually work when we're dealing with many of the you know, profoundly important and powerful influences that have shaped our food system to this point. Um, we're also really keen to take nutritional geometry as a, as a framework mm. and to use it to integrate across levels of biology. And we've, we've spoken about this mm. already um, this morning where you can start to use the same geometric model to, um, to, to start to associate and simplify how nutrition is impacting everything from gene expression through ultimately to population level outcomes. Um, mm. So we're working at every level in that biological hierarchy, including at the moment trying to understand how nu nutritional geometry can explain the structure of of trophic levels within ecosystems. Mm. Why, why are there relatively few trophic levels within all ecosystems um, on the planet? Um, all the way down to what are the fundamental gene regulatory responses um, to nutrition, the common metabolic substrate, which underpins a whole diversity of chronic diseases as well as healthy aging. Mm. Um, and can we focus on those common features and how they can be um, manipulated, intervened in using diet, exercise, uh, sleep, and other sort of so-called preventive measures in a way that can improve health affordably and equitably mm. um, without continuing further along the, um, the highly medicalized model of waiting till people mm. get sick and then trying to fix them with drugs and surgery. Mm -hmm. Just so much more expensive that way to intervene. 
way down the track so from all the well, way of putting it is it's so much more profitable to have people in the way down the track <laughs> <laughs> i love your cynicism david it's beautiful <laughs> so but, but it's, from... true. it's not a criticism it, it is true it's it's what drives the state of the system the ecology mm. that we're in at the moment and we've yeah. got to find the balance between a healthy economy and a healthy population and that's a really important um, um, point of focus in our research for the present and the future. Mm. How do you change, how do you incentivize individuals and governments and communities to change the environment that will then change humans that live within it? And at the moment, our food system is drifting to a, a dystopian sort of place. So from all these decades of research and hundreds literally of studies you've published how does it change the way you live and eat and you know with your family what takeaways do you have that you'd share with people to say you know this is what i'm going to do when i go to my kitchen when i go to the shops what, what takeaways i wouldn't use that word but <laughs> <laughs> Not, don't, don't 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 play takeaway i know that we we both um, we love food where where uh, our families are well fed and we have a love of food. Um, David's a brilliant brewer. Um, we both fish. Many of our best ideas have come while we're fly fishing in Oxford or fishing here. We we grow our own vegetables in the small amount of land that we both have available in our respective houses. We just, you know, and, and we don't eat crap, you know, mm. it, it's because if, if we have it in the house, uh, I'll eat it because I'm yeah. as susceptible as anybody else. <laughs> Even with all the knowledge and intellect yeah, you and have. Uh, that the, Biology is a powerful thing. And if the you reptilian have, instinct. Yeah, and it's not evil. It's just an occasional pleasure rather than mm. chronic exposure. I mean, I do admit I had waffles and cream last night, but I, you know, the time I had it previously must have been six or eight weeks ago. So yeah. that's not going to cause me. That's going. That's pleasurable. It's not going to cause problems to health. Yeah, and I think it's really powerful to differentiate the, the optimal food versus good and bad food. You sort of put it on a spectrum. Is it optimal for my goals versus good or bad and evil, which so much of nutrition devolves into, unfortunately. Yeah, and I think a really important thing that we said at the beginning is to think about your food environment. Now, it's a big project to change our broader food environment, but to change our home food environment mm. is a relatively simple thing. You shop with your brains and then you provide an environment environment where you can make eating decisions with your appetites and they'll mm. do a good job of that if mm. they're in a well-regulated home environment yeah that's really wise advice and Stephen you might have the last word because we kept cutting you off what were you trying to well, say before no, I, I was just going to say it's sort of a, an extension of what we've been saying there avoid zealotry um, mm. you know there, there there are some extraordinary examples out there at the moment of people who are quite literally um, speaking utter rubbish um, for their various ends. Um, and it, we just have to cut through all this. Mm. It's a, an extraordinary and fascinating and complicated subject. Mm. Um, and the solutions in many ways are really very simple, uh, mm. as David said. Uh, shop with your brain, eat with your appetites. Uh, that 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 is awesome advice, and I fully agree. And um, thank you so much for your time this last hour, and just thank you for the work, the career you've invested, and I'm just your research and what you've done is just incredible, and and uh, really appreciate it. And yeah, I can't say thank you enough again. So thank you very much. Thanks for having us, Marty. It was a pleasure. Yeah, Absolute yeah. honour. Thank you so much, guys. See ya. Okay.